Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming into uh, Inside on such a beautiful summer day. Summer's finally come to Minnesota, so we're all taking advantage of it. But this is a really special talk we're doing today. It's part of a series called Minnesota Dance and the Ecstasies of Influences. And so every time we do one of these talks, we have a different theme. Today is about Latin dance, moving narratives in Latin dance. And you'll see around on the table and behind on the wall, these were previous talks. There's Native American dance and tap dance, and you'll find all different kinds of um, maps that are being made as the stories are being told. So Kristen Van Loon here is our magic mapper, and so she will follow the conversation and start to show how those influences create a network and how we're all connected and influenced by each other. I want to thank uh, the Cole Center. This is the third year of the series, so this is the twelfth part we do. And um, we have our sponsor is the Performing Arts Archives at the University Libraries, and so it's great to be in partnership with them. We do videos of the talks, and then we give those videos to the archives so that researchers in the future can learn about what we're doing today and how, as a network, we are making dance thrive in Minnesota. I'm going to pass it over to our host, Giselle Mejia, and I'm really so thankful that she put this panel together because I think we're in for a really great treat. Here you go. Okay, hello, and thank you all so much, first of all, for being here. I know there's a lot going on um, today in particular, and, uh, and will enjoy the weather. I just will also want to mention, if you're interested, right after the discussion, uh, Leo Pachau will be teaching upstairs um, an hour of Zouk and then an hour of Samba. So join us, please. So um, my story begins, and um, my mother, uh, Pat Patricia Schaber, <laughs> um, she, at a very early age, even before I was born, instilled a lot of values of the, um, the movement of the hippies. And um, she joined the Peace Corps and went down and met my father in Cuenca, Ecuador, um, where they met dancing. And so it was from birth where that kind of movement was always a part of me. And uh, so... So I really believe that uh, a lot of my roots continue to bring me back to Ecuador. Um, my family is there in Esmeraldas, which is on the coast. And, uh, and so they had uh, marimba music and dance, which is a traditional dance of the people of the African diaspora that were brought over uh, to Colombia and Ecuador and the coast. And uh, so I've continued to study that throughout my years as a dancer. But that's where it began, and that's what it, where it will continue. Um, so after they, my mother and father met, they came home with two children and me inside of her, and they lived in Rogers, Minnesota. And that's like, you know, country town. And um, unfortunately, my father experienced a lot of racism, and. It, it wasn't a very pleasant experience for him as a, um, a person who studied, he was studying to be a doctor, and yet he was painting houses. And um, so I saw, you know, he taught me the Latin social dances. And so every time as a, I would grow up, he actually moved back to Puerto Rico, and he's lived there for 30 some years of my life and now recently moved back to the farm in Esmeraldas to be with his, my grandmother. And they, he's um, had a career as a surgeon and now he's on the farm and he's really loving it and that was always his dream. But so um, throughout my childhood, starting as like an 11 year old girl, I would, I would take a flight by myself to visit him in Puerto Rico and um, I just remember that being so special because that was really my connection to him and uh, dance 
became my way of communicating to my family who uh, spoke only Spanish. And so I would go down to Ecuador and we would dance together and we could communicate in that way until over the years, continuing to travel to countries of um, Spanish descent, I learned the language. And um, so that's a part of... Um, also, as a young girl, my mother and some women, they organized a group called Parents of Latin American Children. And so that was very um, impactful to, to me as a young girl and my family, where we would always go to this, it's a culture camp, it's called La Semana. And when I went to La Semana, they would teach us it would be one week with other adopted youth of Latin America. We weren't adopted, but we were maybe the only family that wasn't of adopted. And um, we would learn the dances, of the, the traditional dances, and it was, it was such an important moment for my childhood because I saw people around me and I learned these moving narratives and I just, I finally felt something that a sense of belonging. And so my teacher, Maria Teresa, she was a very powerful Colombian woman. And um, she taught me about dance and how disciplined and focused you need to be to be a dancer. Um, I continued studying dance uh, in my bachelor's degree in New York and my brother was there at the Juilliard School and we would always get together on the weekends to social dance and um, create dances and a lot of what I was creating as a choreographer was like uh, dances of the destruction of the Amazon rainforest and really um, always very, Im uh, I was always really um, tied to kind of the um, just what I experienced when I would go back to Ecuador and I would see the land changing, not always for the better, and uh, the people and their connection to agriculture and water. And then we, together, we um, moved to Chicago and we, this is my brother Dario Mejia, he's a choreographer as well, and uh, we um, became a part of Luna Negra Dance Company uh, which was combining contemporary ballet with the infusion of Latin American dances. And that was a really beautiful and important company for me to work with. Um, and so I've been now continuing to study. At, at a, I just got my master's degree last weekend in... Um, <laughs> And uh, there's a display over there. Um, a lot of the books that I've continued to, to study um, about the history of the narratives of Latin dances. And um, my thesis was entitled Moving Narratives in Marimba, Music and Dance of the, Pacifical, the Pacific Coastal Regions of um, Ecuador and Colombia. And so what I've learned in studying the meaning and the narratives behind the dances, whether they're social or traditional, it's a, it's, um, much of it is about that community and about how you relate to another person because when you're partner dancing, it's one of the most intimate feelings I've ever experienced, period. Even with a stranger, um, you can get to such a deep level of awareness through the movement. Um, yeah, and you don't have to even know their name, and yet you can communicate with them at such a deep level. And that's what's so powerful for me um, as a dancer. And, um, you know, being in Minnesota, I've met really wonderful people within the community. And Alice has, she's a photographer, and you'll see some of her photos. She's done an incredible job documenting a lot of our performances. When I came back to Minnesota after doing some national touring, um, I studied intensely with Renee Thompson, who you'll be hearing, and uh, Yenel Chini Perez, um, who has been in some of the photos. He, and uh, now I'm studying 
uh, Zook with Leo Pachau. And um, I, I just feel like I've continued to curate what my experience in dance is. Um, and you all, you'll always do that as a professional dancer. You, you can't stop learning. And, um, and you can get really in depth with one thing. Or like me, I, I feel like I've just been a chameleon and always wanted to learn about more and just uh, read books about it and go to the countries and experience it firsthand. And that's what I like to teach my students as well. So I'm going to hand it off now and we'll hear from Leo de Paixão. <laughs> I'm trying to say it correctly. And it's, so it's my pleasure to introduce him. He's a wonderful artist and instructor of Brazilian dances. He's also a student at Augsburg College. He's a very close friend and dance partner. So, Leo Pachau. Hi, uh, so yeah, my name is Leo da Pachau. It's a hard, last, the last name is very hard to pronounce. It actually means a passion, so it's kind of cool, I think. Um, so I was born in Brazil, and uh, the city where I'm from is, is Salvador, and uh, we have a joke that we say, we don't born, we premiere, because everybody does some type of art, you know, it's like it's people sing, or we'll dance, or, we'll, you know, some type of art. Um, in my case, I remember, uh, when I started dancing, when I was a kid, I, I wasn't so natural. I remember my sister always telling me, I was like, oh, can you stop? You are the rhythm. <laughs> and it was like, I couldn't tell that. Um, <clears throat> but then, uh, eventually, I was, you know, I, 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 tried, I keep trying, so I kept dancing. And uh, I think one, one of the powerful moments, actually, that got me even more into the dance, it was... Uh, when I watched the movie Dirty Dance. <laughs> and I saw Pat Schwiz, like, what's the name of the actress? Uh, no, the actress, the woman. Anyway, he, we're doing the. Yeah, so it's like, I, when I saw the movie, I was fascinated. Yeah, that's what, I was fascinated about it. And it was like, wow, I really want to learn partner dancing. And, uh, but you know, what I was mostly doing as a kid, I did a lot of samba, I did a lot of solo dance. I actually didn't get into partner dance like when I was a teenager. And that's when I, <clears throat> I finally, I had an opportunity. Uh, there was a person who came into school and asked who wanted to do, learn partner dance. And the whole school, there was me and another guy who actually wanted to take class, learn partner dance. Even though like we're all dance, but you know mostly you do solo dance. Now it's changing. There's a lot of more people dancing, and uh, so since then I've been um, been taking many classes. I, I took uh, many, mostly partner dance classes. Uh, besides the the solo dance that I grew up doing, I did tango. I did samba. I learned the salsa, but I learned not the Cuban salsa. I learned the New York style salsa and. Uh, I did many forms of dance. Like in Brazil, usually if you do partner dance, you, you gotta know many types. And there was people who were very important. Um, there was the first dance instructor, his name is Jonatas Firmato. And uh, he was the one that introduced me into dance. And then after that, they had another instructor, uh, Yuma Santos, and then another one, Sandro Guedes. So it was like, even though I, so I started was a lot of influence of the dance, but the dance I like the dance, but not to perform or to teach. I like to dance just for fun. So then I was trying other things. I was trying acting. I was trying like sing. I'm not good singing, but I, I still sing in the group. <laughs> and uh, another thing I tried to I tried playing instruments. Um, I played saxophone and then flute. The problem was, uh, especially with the music, that was the thing I mostly wanted to do it. It was too expensive for my parents to afford, but at the end, I just needed my body. So it was a, there was an instrument that was always available. So uh, I kept doing, I kept dancing. And uh, so I remember when I was dancing again, uh, my sister came to party because then I would cut home and say, come here, I want to practice your move that I learned today. I would go on the bus, like memorizing the move. 
when I get in classes, like I would juice and practice with her. And uh, so that time she wouldn't complain that I had a bad rhythm. <laughs> now I was learned. <clears throat> so I think like since I grew up in Salvador, I had uh, so much influence of like different dances and music. Um, I think it really helped me as a, as a dancer today and that even my failure experience as trying to be a musician, like the, all the, you know, I learned about music, uh, try to sing, like the acting, all those things that I did, even though my dancing was not my target in the beginning, I think they all helped me to get, um, to be, you know, to dance the way I dance today. And uh, <clears throat> so when, while I was in Brazil, I met my ex, and uh, we actually met on the bus, and uh, we were going to a dance, uh, we have just gotten back to a dance concert. And uh, we met on the bus, and then we got to stay in touch for, she had like just two weeks to come back, so we kept in touch. I remember at the time, I had no email. I had never written an email. So I didn't even have an email that by then, so it was like one friend that helped me to uh, set up an account. So I did set up an account. I remember my first email, it took me a whole hour to type. <laughs> and there was like, you know, <clears throat> so we kept in touch. She was here, she went back to Minnesota for a whole year. And then she went back to Brazil. And then we stayed for six months there. And after that, um, we decided that we would move here. I didn't really want to come here. I was kind of like, I was having ideas like, I had a bad, uh, Bad, bad image about the United States. I love Minnesota, so it's like, then I had a bad image and my concept, and, the, and then I never want to come here. So I finally did come, and uh, I started, <clears throat> I had a, a first workshop, a samba workshop, and that was like a disaster, because uh, I had no English, and then my, so my ex was trying to translate it for me, and the people was not understand, it was like, I was so disappointed that I stopped like wanting to teach. So it's like, I don't want to teach anymore. And it was kind of interesting because the way I got back into dance was because uh, there's this person called Bernice. Mom, if you guys might have taken class with her. And then she said, oh, you should teach uh, Zumba. I said, okay, Zumba will teach. At least I don't have to speak. You know, I just get there, stop moving. <laughs> and, then, and that was the way that I got back into dance. So I started doing Zumba. And uh, it was very fun. I never really did true Zumba. I was doing more dance. I would not, not did like so much aerobics. People who actually started coming to my class, they liked the dance part. And then from the dance, <clears throat> there were some people who started asking me, like, oh, you should, you should teach, you should teach. I was like, I was already, I was teaching in Brazil, and then kind of came here, I stopped teaching. And I said, okay, maybe I'll start teaching again. So I started doing Zumba, and then I did some, uh, partner dance, I think I did some bolero, Brazil, I have a, a, a Cuban version of bolero. Uh, I mean, it's like a Brazilian version of a <laughs> And uh, so I got in, I stopped, I stopped dancing. I remember Giselle actually said that when you dance Giselle, Giselle came, the way we got to know each other, it's kind of interesting because she came one day to my class and say, I want to perform with you. <laughs> and then I was never, never really like begin to perform like I enjoy performing but it's not I'm not crazy for it but I said sure let's do it and then she learned very quick and then we did oops and like in six months we were able to perform and uh and we we're going July to San Francisco to teach now the Zook Congress and uh yeah so I've been here teaching for, for a while so again Zumba introduced me to back to dance and then now I've been teaching continuously. Uh, right now I do samba and I do zouk. If you guys haven't ever heard of zouk, it's the new lambada. It's like a more sensual part in dancing. And uh, yeah, I've been having so much fun with it. <laughs> and now I feel very honored to welcome the next dancer, choreographer, and educator of Afro-Cuban folkloric and popular dances. Rene is the director of Street to Stage Dance Company and has re national recognition for his amazing career in dance and instruction in Cuban cabaret and traditional music and dance of Cuba. Welcome, Rene.
What a, yeah. Sí, sí. Yep. I had to bring the book because I forgot things and I talk too much sometimes. We only have a minute. Uh, oh. <laughs> See? <laughs> All right. Well, my name is uh, Rene Thompson Sanchez. I'm from Cuba. And then it's, um, some people ask me why uh, Thompson in Cuba. Well, my, my family is really diverse. Uh, my grandfather from England, my mm, grandmother from Spain, one of, from my mother's side. From my father's side, so my grandmother with uh, Yoruba tribe from Nigeria. And my mother half Cuban, half Puerto Rican, so all that diversity was my uh, early age inspiration to 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 dance. You know, I was telling uh, my friends here that um, since I was a kid, you know, I see my grandmother uh, watching, you know, the clothing and how she dancing, singing, move with that language that I don't remember, and uh, I mean that I don't, don't, don't understand. And I see my mother doing the same duty, but with different beats, and with different songs, and with different language. And that curiosity brought me to, 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 to want to, to know more about my heritage and then uh, learn about the Afro-Cuban religion and where they come from and all the orichas and everything. So everybody knows that um, Cuban was colonized by the Spaniards, so we speak Spanish, and we were, most of the, of the country are Catholic. But in the early times of Columbus, we have African um, people, you know. So today, the 75% of the Cuban population in believing in religion and, and everything has to do with Africa. We have a deep, deep African roots, like Brazil, like Puerto Rico, like all the Caribbean islands who, who has a slave brought to, to work in the Cuban field. That was my, my real inspiration. But I remember uh, another thought, anecdote when I was a kid. I, I like to, to, to dance rumba. Since you get up in Cuba, if anybody knows about Cuban, like Puerto Rico, is uh, everything's about music, about music. Since you get up in the morning, you know, this is what you hear. And people go do the, the, the house duty, dancing and singing. You go to school, and after math and biology and lecture, it's music, it's about music and, uh, and about dance. So my father was um, really passionate for the drink, from the alcohol, from the <laughs> and then uh, she, she, he likes to, to drink a lot, but sometimes back in the day in the 1960s, wasn't enough money to buy the drink, but there is always time for, to play rumba in the corner on the street. And then they have a famous Cuban rumba who call, uh, the name is, um, if you break it, you pay for it. So they play the rumba and they put a bottle of wine or the rum and you have to dance, you know, all over the, the bottle. If you break it, you have to pay for it. But if not, when the music ends, you own that. So my father saw me dance rumba all the time and he said, ooh, that's my chance. Grammy said, come on, dance. So I danced rumba, and um, I win. I didn't brought the, the, the bottle, so he got drunk with that bottle. Of so since I was so little, I remember that, that that was my beginning as a dancer. But being the son of the black guy and the white um, woman, in the beginning of the revolution, before the revolution, because I was born in 1952, before the revolution wasn't any chance for us to have any, any real place. You know, the, the, the discrimination and the isolation was terrible. And then uh, I can be myself in the black neighborhood because I wasn't black enough to be part of them, neither in the white. So as a mix, we have to create our own identity you know, so we use the rumba and the song. We start to create things to, to expression, our feelings. So we got the, the straight position, the elegance from the, from the white uh, salons, you know, when they play walls and everything. And we have that body move, that hot African mode in our body from, from the Africans. So now we create something so sticky that everybody likes it. Revolution came to the picture 
revolution came to the picture, nos dio that kind of freedom. So now black and whites are the same. We eat the same plates and we go to the same places. And that was our chance to expose, to, to, to display all that talent and all that things that we got for the two cultures. And then, um, like Leo, I just try, you know, I try everything. But my parents, they were so into my kids gonna have the chance to go to the school that didn't, we, we didn't have. Revolution put, the, the Cuban Revolution put all, all the free education so you can go to school you don't have to pay for, you know, and they saw, okay, this is the older of the 10 kids, and this is the one who's gonna take us out of the poorness, and they sent me to medical school to be a doctor. Whew. In their mind, they're gonna put my, my real clinic and, you know, take them out of the hole. But uh, what they didn't know that inside me was that box for the dance and the things, and I don't care about too much people crying and, and, and suffering in the, in, the, in the ER room. You know, I don't want to be surrounded by blood and people screaming, save my daughter, you know. For me, it was more fun to listen to the music, see the people waving the body with the beat and everything, so that's what I choose against their will. So because I was a bad behavior boy, boy, they kicked me out of the house. They don't want me to go back again because I want to be a dancer and they want me to be a doctor. So I don't really, I never had a really a dance uh, experience, in dance school experience, or have teachers, or have anybody. I just jump into the stage and, and I, I clean up all my moves and everything, you know, working. Start to work. And then he said, introduced me as a cabaret um, instructor. That was my, oh, my biggest influence and inspiration. The cabaret in Cuba has different concept of the cabaret around the world. In Cuba, the cabaret is like here, always theater or state theater, where you go to see musicals, when you see amazing musicians, you know, from all over the world, especially from Cuba, you know, and the most incredible dancers that you can ever imagine, performing for the family. So you have a good family time with, with you, your um, family or friends, you know, you have a good meal and you enjoy a big, a big show. show you know, with everything but, but circus. And then uh, that was my first experience, just trying to sneak out of it, and I see all those dancers, I said, ah. Oh. And then I went to, um, to do an audition um, uh, for, to be a dancer. And then, but my first star was as an as a, as a actor. I started acting with uh, Cuatro de Abril with Tito Junco you know, like him, and then uh, try to play some instrument. And then he came once to me and said, you know what, you have a really good things to be an actor. I think you are a really drama guy that you can do it, but unfortunately you were born without the powerful voice that the theater actor needs. You bo your voice is too weak, and I don't think you're ever gonna go over that. Back in the 60s and 70s, guys, no wireless microphone or anything was about acoustic. And my voice was <laughs> But he said, but, but beside that, you have an angel dancing. Why are you not trying to be a dancer better than an actor? And I said, well, if you think so. So he introduced me one of the most uh, important Cuban choreographer, Teresita, which is the director of Conjunto Folklorico Nacional, well known all over the world. And this is how I started. From there, we only have eight minutes to talk, so I'm just gonna cut it off from there. I just get out of Cuba in the big uh, show company because remember, because the block kill, um, Cuba need to survive uh, out of the, the sport of the music and dance because we don't have any real things to bring money inside Cuba. Like all the country has oil and gold or something. We only had sugar, tobacco, rum, and dance, music, a lot of music. So this is how I get off Cuba, you know, dancing for the company to bring money to Cuba. And one of the, the talent hunters find me in Peru and propose me to come to America. 
he says, man, you can do it big in America. But he didn't know my age. So I said, yes, I'm going. So I came to America. I didn't know that I'm never going to be, I'm going to be totally isolated from, from Cuba. And 38 years later, I don't even know when my parents are buried. I don't remember my family practically, but because I never couldn't come back or I don't have any communication with them. And he thought that when he saw me dance and sing and play the instrument, he said, oh, you're going to make it big in the United States. But once again, he didn't know my, my age. So when I came over here and I was introducing, I was doing casting, you know, I was accepted from the first time. And by the time that I'm going to sign the contract and I put my age in there, they dumped me. They said, no, you can be the grandpa of the dancer. We are looking for 18 to 25. You are already 34. Come on, go home. Yeah, until uh, one of uh, the greatest, you know, uh, for the Latin, for the Latin people here, for especially for Cuba, Emilio Estefan and Neri Torres from from Miami Sound Machine. They found me and they said, "Man, you are the one who wants, who who want, uh, we're looking for." So it doesn't matter your age. You know, the way you dance and the way you communicate, what you transmit is what, what we need in our show. So long story short, I start to dance with Gloria, from Gloria to ba 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 Gloria Stefan in Miami so much. You know, like this, that's my career in the United States. And in 1999, at the end of 1999, was a really big situation with, uh, with uh, millennium things and the computers and everything. We were invited to perform here in the higher hotels in the private millennium uh, to receive the 2000 uh, New Year's and everything's here. So they brought us over here. And after the show, they immediately flew us to Miami because the computer thing that was in the, but before I leave, I found a good, really good friend of mine here they invited me to come to visit Minnesota. And I came to Minnesota and I saw the snow and the call, and people doing the angel and everything, and say, yes. <laughs> First time in my life that I was, I saw the snow before, but never, like, leave, you know, and I love Minnesota. And I just came over here, I didn't know that I'm gonna be that long, and the winter gonna be that hard, <laughs> to be honest. And then, uh, I never thought to teach, I thought I'm gonna perform, that was my, my deal, to perform. And then I was invited to do a workshop at Four Seasons Dance Studio, and I, I don't speak English, so I have the translator who traveled with me everywhere, and my agent talking, but was a disaster. Like, <laughs> you know, they were saying something that is not what I was feeling in that moment, and they, they were describing my dances as not, I said, no, come on. But the good times, always the good time, and I have, a, a, a big bless to meet Manny Rubio. Actually, I didn't meet him until I get to the place. But he, Manny Rubio, it was, for me, is the father of, of, of a, a Latin movement here in, in Minnesota. So he speaks Spanish like me. So first time in Minnesota to find someone who understands what I say. You know, he invited me to perform in his, and do a class in his class at First Avenue. And that was my beginning, you know, so people can see the connection in between the Puerto Rican styles and music and the region of all that Latin culture and the Cuban. The similarity in the same flag and, uh, you know, the, the culture is too close, but also has some difference. You know, he gave me the chance and from there I start. Long story short, I found my... My, my um, group was uh, Havana Club, started to sing. I was a lead singer because, like, I'm not a great singer, but I sing. And I play five instruments. I'm not a great, great musician, never studied music, but by ear I can do it. And then I start to teach and do classes here in Minnesota. And one of the things who kept me keep going through all these years, after 17 years, is the feeling that I bring to the stage to empower people to go over the, 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 the problems. You know, I met so many, so many people in my 40-some years career. 
so many people, but I never went into people's life. You know, it's, it's just to do a class, people come, pay the fee, have fun, and that's it. And then I work so hard with professional dancers like Giselle, you know, but, um, but I see people coming back, coming back classes, coming back, coming back, coming back. So I realize that I don't create dancers, I create followers, I create community of dancers, the people who doesn't want to become a professional dancer so they don't care about the position of the body or the arms and everything, but the fun that the, that, that the music brings, they just got out of the, the situation at home or job, the stress and, you know. So I used to have, I don't know if you see, oh, this is one of the pictures you're gonna see with the long hair. For years I was growing my hair and when it's long enough, I cut it and, and, and donate it to the cancer. There you go, see the hair, long hair. <laughs> so I cut my hair like this and donated to the kid with cancer because I, I, I went to the, to the St. Jude and like American Cancer Society in Park Avenue. And I see, you know, when I start to dance and sing and make people connect, I saw how those kids went through the chemotherapy easier without crying, without things, you know. I work with, uh, with Avius Father, 16 and Lake Street, this organization for the fatherhood, the single fathers, and I go there, and I saw how, you know, dancing with the kids and everything at least made them, the life go a little easier than at that time. I work with a youth, a risk, you, I'm sorry, my English, at risk youth, so I go to the penitentiary and everything with the, the, the gang kids are and I teach them how the music made me to survive a communist and, and get out of the Cuba and everything being black and being Latino, being no English and old and old. You know how I, I follow my, 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 my instinct in my career and I went and I don't drink and I don't smoke and I don't do anything that people does. It's not criticizing, but I don't do it. I think the music and the dance take more time for me than to go outside and smoke a cigarette. Besides that I save money, all right? <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, when I see those people coming back and I ask, are you sure you want to pay that private lesson? It's $70. And he said, $70 is nothing compared with the joy that I feel when I'm dancing. You know, how I relax, how my body works. Since I take in class and I start to know my body and what I can do with it, you know, so $70 comes and go. But what you are teaching me or the moment that I'm having here, stay with me. <sighs> I say, damn, that's what I want to teach. And that's what keeps me, you know. For the last 10 years, I've been teaching at, at uh, Midtown Global Market you know, in Lake in Chicago, in the old Sears building, free, 10 years, every Sunday. In the beginning, every other Sunday now, for free, for the community. If you see that, some of the pictures, this is one of my choreography. Some of the pictures that you see there, following people that all ages, this for free. I just want to bring the, to give the, the community what the community gave me through all these years, you know, the joy and everything, so I want to teach people the power healing of the music and dance. Just five minutes of music is, is, is like five years of life. You know, when you are dancing, because you are focusing to listen to the music, put your body on beat and follow the instruction, you don't think in bills, you don't think in debt, in IRS, or illegal immigrants, you don't think in anything. You just go and then it's life. When you are free of stress, you are in dance, in, in, in life, getting life. And again, I would like to, before I finish, I would like to uh, thanks to every single one of the Americans in the United States who opened their arm to receive us over here. You know, uh, it's sad to say it, but in my country, I couldn't do not even a quarter of what I did in 30 some years here. So I love America with all the deficit, with all the problem because I found here more 
more joy and more opportunity than in my own country. When I got my family and I got the love of my family and the taste of my culture and my food, but I don't have the freedom that I have in America to create, to you know, display my talent, to do things. So thank you to all of you for accepting me. Thank you to yourself and Michelle for inviting me to be here. Thank you to all the people who have been influencing my life because, as Giselle says, we are regrowing. We never stop to dance. I start to dance sometimes in 1973. I'm 65 years old. I'm still dancing and growing and growing and growing. I got the master who opens the door for all Latinos here. I love it. I work with him, too. I had the fortune to work with Leo, with Giselle, and uncountable. Uh, dancers, but most with people. You know, dancers is something, those professional dancers is something that they choose, like they choose to be part of their career. You know, from one reason or another one, from one influence or another one, they choose to be a dancers. But you guys, it's just hobby until you find, you discover, you know, what you are able to do through the music and dancing. This is my goal. Now in my, in my late age, when I was young, I don't think that way. But now that I can see all of you here, all that smile. So thank you so very much to all of you. And now I would like to introduce Eliezer Ramirez Vargas. He is professional dancer and instructor and an the owner, together with his wife, Rebecca, they own the Costa Rican Ballroom located in Hopkins. Um, Eliezer is a Costa Rican salsa champion and founder of the Costa Rican Ballroom and Dance Sport Association. Welcome, Eliezer. So I have a big notebook, you can see. Let's frame it. Um, so thank you for the opportunity today. I want to take you on a little journey from my childhood to today here in the call center. Um, my childhood began in the jungles of Costa Rica. Um, I don't come from a dance family, no musicians, no dancers. I come from farmers. So we, uh, we were uh, coffee farmers in Costa Rica. So my first memories of my childhood was being outside the house in a sunny morning, trying to catch a beautiful, colorful butterfly with orange, yellow, and red colors. And I was a kid, I fell in love with the butterfly and I wanted to have it for me. So I get closer and closer and every time I about to catch it, she flies away. And then I walk away and tried to catch it again. And I was determined to have this butterfly. But I keep walking away and away, trying to catch it every time. And pretty soon I discovered that I was far from our home, which was a tiki house. Uh, the house was made of palm tree leaves, and same was our mattress. The floor was soil, no electricity, no running water. It was a simple uh, life it gets. Um, now that I remember, for me, sounds like heaven. Back at the moment, it was more like, I don't know if I can say the word, but it was not a pleasant place to, to live. It was kind of hard. But continuing with the butterfly story, as I got far, by my fifth attempt to try to catch the butterfly, I discovered a huge, snake, a boa snake looking at me, standing up, just looking at me, and I panicked for a moment, and then I start running away to the house. This is why I don't like snakes at all. <laughs> and we had taken a students, some of our students to Costa Rica, and we go to see the snakes and everything, and I, they never know probably this secret, but I hate seeing them, because uh, this story, not only that one, but it was oftentimes the story almost of every day and encountered with a poisonous snake. So that's the memory I have of my childhood 
in Costa Rica, and the, the reason why I did that was to show you this picture that my wife Rebecca put together, and it symbolized a little bit of where I come from, and you can see in the back the butterflies, uh, small ones, you cannot see from there, but you can look at it afterwards. So, from the from living in the jungle was terrible. You had to walk two ways to catch the bus. School was two hours away. You had to cross rivers, and if you come back too late at night, the currents will rise, so you cannot cross. If you have horses, same province. So we farm our own vegetables and fruits. We have a couple cows, two sheep, hams, chickens, and just very basic living. And um, from there, my mother got very tired of, we were 10 children, and she got very tired of living in that situation. My father was the one who chose to live there. So my mom said, okay, I'm, I'm done with this. We're moving out of this. So we moved to the city, uh, to my grandparents' uh, house, close to, to uh, other coffee plantations, where actually that's where coffee kind of got more into my life because we all work into coffee plantations. Uh, and that's what I had done since I was a kid. So dancing never had been even uh, an option in my family because the first option is to work and to bring kind of food to the table. Um, dancing was something that I was forced to do in elementary school in Costa Rica because, you know, the civic acts and the national holidays, they put the little kids with the hats and the folkloric uh, um, outfits. So that's how it started, but I kind of, um, people start kind of clapping for us and things, and I was like, hmm. I never been uh, really a center of any type of attention, and I kind of feeling good that people are kind of clapping. And then uh, for Mother's Day, we created a little group where uh, some kids was, uh, they thought it was really nice to simulate kiss, you know, the group kiss from the US because Costa Ricans love American culture. And uh, so I was the singer. I never seen the group or anything, they just paint me. and. My, my hair brush was my microphone. <laughs> and, uh, and the parents love it. And I thought, oh, maybe something to this. But you know, I, I could not dance at all. I, I seriously, you know, I teach dance now. And, and I consider myself a pretty good dancer. But I could not dance. I, I had no coordination. I cannot hear music. Uh, so I had to train. All of this has been to training and dedication because uh, for me it's never been actually easy to dance uh, so I have put my heart into get the training with professionals and people who know more than me and get inspiration into music um, but dancing became big part of my life because in poverty poverty can drive you crazy because if you don't have money uh, you don't have good health or you have family problems it's just too much sometimes to handle and I always found an escape in, in dancing. Uh, it was not salsa where I started dancing. I was more like doing hip hop because I have electricity in my home when I was 18 for the first time. So we didn't have a TV or anything like that. Uh, I used to go to the neighbors to watch the, it was a show called Ola Who and Two. And they put all the American videos, the new kids in the block, Vanilla Ice, NC Hammer, and I was like, oh, this is kind of fun. And then uh, I still remember all those steps. To nowadays, people call it old school hip hop. And um, so I used to go to the club every Sunday from 1 to 5. And I danced four hours, kind of reggaeton, and old school hip hop with Michael Jackson and all those great singers. Um, but eventually, when they started doing the salsa part, I had to sit down because I didn't know how to dance salsa until one day one of my um, schoolmates brought me to the club and said, hey, can you dance with me? I want to dance salsa, but I never done it and I need a partner. So she showed me the basic salsa step and, uh, and that's how everything started. You know, uh, with that one step of salsa, it led to two, to three, and I just fell in love with the music and by visiting uh, the clubs, uh, I was discovered by 
um, lady who owns the Center of Arts uh, Promenade in Costa Rica, the biggest school in, in Central America. And they say, hey, we just opened a big school and we need a performance team and we're looking for dancers. And would you like to be a dancer? And I was like, oh, me? I was like, oh, me, okay. Well, sure, absolutely, I go. You know, because I never want to miss opportunities, so I always kind of say yes to things. So when I got there, everybody was already really good. I could not even coordinate my arms. You know, when you dance, you're not supposed to move the hands like this because that's called, like, some people call it monkey walk, which I saw in the jungle, so I can do that pretty well as well. But um, I was very afraid. I was uh, shaking. I got panic attacks, and, and everybody was dancing the choreography, and I could not do one step. So I was sweating. My heart was uh, racing, and then I, I passed uh, the first practice. Everybody was fantastic already. So little by little, I continued to come to practice. The other uh, team members didn't show up so many times because they thought they were gray already, which they were. And four years later, I was the only one left in the school. Everybody had quit, and I started uh, actually booking performances and booking my teachers to go and do shows with me. And I convinced them to, you know, I wanted to learn English because I, I, my high school, I could not completely finish English. I chose French instead of English because I thought it was easier. Because I have a full time during the day and I have a, my high school, I did it all overnight. So during the day work and I go to school. Um, so I don't want to lose track of my thoughts here. So continuing with my story. So. Um, they took me to the team, I started performing, I, con I, I convinced my teacher that she should come with me to the US in the team, and they should pay for it because it was great for their school, because I had no money, and I couldn't get a visa neither. And they said, sure, we go. And I never look a map of the US, I didn't know what it looks like or where the states were, I just hear United States of America is great, you should go there. And we went to, we took a plane, and then we took another one, and another one, and they started getting smaller and smaller. And we landed in Moscow, Idaho. <laughs> and, uh, and I always wanted to see the big buildings and the bridges that you see in the movies. So I went from pretty much the jungle to the Native Americans in the north part of Idaho. And I was like, okay, well. I guess that's, uh, this is America. And then, uh, and then we went back to Costa Rica and I still was anxious to get to see the US. And by teaching in the school, I met some people from Minnesota, some students who told me that I could become a millionaire here. And since me being so poor all my life and through the struggles of, of poverty, I thought, Sure, I do it. I didn't ask how or anything. I just said, yeah, I go. So they say, okay, you can come and stay with us for three months until you get on your feet, and then we show you the way around, and then you can start your, your making all your money with your great dancing. I go, sounds pretty simple. I will sell my car for $300, buy a plane ticket in 2000, in 2000. and I, that day it was a picture there where somebody did a documentary from the school about me moving to the US to dance. They thought I was being hired here to be a star, but not really. I was just coming here to try a new, new venture. So I took the plane. Uh, when we were landing in Minneapolis, the plane, uh, the landing gear didn't work. So they said the, the plane was gonna land flat on the runway and we were gonna have to slide on the sliders. And I didn't speak English, so somebody was translating this to me, and they were not telling me everything. And uh, so the first thing that came to my mind was, how stupid can I be to come and die so far from home? And, uh, and you know, my mother is very Catholic, so I pray, and I say, okay, well, it's going to be what it's going to be. That's it. I guess I'm dying here. I don't know how they're going to get me back there. <laughs> And, uh, and then they did it manually, and then it worked out. The, the gear came down, and everything was safe. 
I got to the gate, my past students were there waiting for me, and they told me, we have something to tell you. When we offered you to come to the US, we were joking. We never thought you would do it, and we are completely stressed out that we would never expect that you show up, and you did, so now we don't know what to do with you. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I don't know. I mean, I'm here, and I had no money, hardly any money. So they let me stay with them. They said, like, we're going to let you stay with us two weeks, and I was in Uptown, and I stayed in their couch for two weeks, and then they found me in some basement in Norris, Minneapolis. Uh, I didn't have a job of money. The lady let me stay there for a while until I got a job and get some money to pay her the back rent. So I started going out dancing a lot. And then I started asking people, start saying, oh, you dance pretty good salsa. Why don't you teach me? I said, yeah, I have a studio in Norris. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, so I gave them the address, and uh, I booked lessons. And what I did is when they show up, if they can afford, at 3 p.m., I move all the furniture to the laundry room. Actually, I don't have n hardly any furniture. It's just like a mattress and a little table, so it was not such a big deal. So I started teaching there. I didn't speak English. I got a printout of forward, back, left, right, and then I just point, and I just do signals. Like, you know, dancing is a language, so you don't have to talk much sometimes to teach dance. And uh, that's how I started, going to places like First Avenue, I landed here April 16, uh, on a Tuesday in 2000. Um, my friend said you should go to First Avenue and dance with me some salsa and I'm sure we will win the contest. And I was like, sure, I mean, you know, I don't want to be difficult and I'm open to try new things. I show up there, the first guy I met was Manuel and then she signed us up to dance and I danced and we won. And that was 300 bucks, so now I had 300, and now it was 300 split into two, so that will make 450. My partner said, you keep the money, you just got here. So I go, okay, this is looking pretty promising. Now I had 600 bucks. And, um, and then I started going to Margarita Bella, if you guys remember. Uh, First Avenue, of course, always Minneapolis Cafe, Fridays and Saturdays, Conga Latin Bistro, and The Quest. And, uh, and then I start Latin nights, I start promoting. In 2003, I started a salsa night on Tuesdays. There was the worst night at Conga. Nobody will go there. I met this guy called Damian, who is from Cuba. And I think he brought you and a bunch of people. And they have a group of musicians. And they play, and I pay them, and I make a little. And, and I start turning things around. During the time that I was going out to Minneapolis Cafe, I met a lady who said, you should become a ballroom dancer. You will be great and you can get a job. And I go, yeah, absolutely. So I went there and I did an audition and they hired me. And that's how my story begins about ballroom dancing. Uh, that's where I met Sally, one of my students who's here, and she saw me in the beginning where I could not speak English or anything, but she's still taking lessons with me, so obviously I did something right. Um, so my story started like that. I traveled all over Europe. Uh, I got to go to Hawaii, uh, France, Spain, Italy, England. I represent Costa Rica in the World Championships uh, with my wife, Rebecca, who has been a great influence in my career and has taught me a lot of great things. And today I still visit my home. My family cannot travel here because Many Americans don't know this, but it's very, very, very hard to get a visa to come here. It's a, it's a visitor, not even to work. Forget about work. Just to visit is very, very hard. So, you know, we got married, and then we did another wedding there so my family can be part of it. Um, but I am very thankful for Minnesota as well. You know, Costa Rica is full of opportunities. We have a democracy. We are the only country in the world with no army. Uh, we have free education, free health care, and sounds pretty good, but still uh, it's very hard to make money. You can make maybe $4 or $5, $10 a day. And um, so, you know, when they put the picture to move to Minnesota, it sounds like a very good picture for me. And being since uh, my life has been just 
uh, with poverty, I thought, yeah, I'm going to go there and make money. So my goal was that I will help my mother from then forward because, you know, I didn't want her to keep suffering with poverty and not having enough to eat and all those things. So today, um, for me, it's easy because now my mother is in a salary, so she gets a certain amount of money a month. Uh, thanks to Rebecca and ideas and my ideas, uh, we have some properties in Costa Rica. We rent them, and with the money that we made then, we help all the family. We have our own home here, our own business, and we have a lot of projects. Rebecca is a great artist, and we're trying to create art with dance now. She's illustrating and building new projects to you know, spread through the U.S. Um, but the goal is that we continue dancing, performing, and very soon you're going to see me dancing with our baby Lucia, who is running around. And, uh, and I'm so, so uh, happy and honored to be invited here by Michelle and Giselle. Uh, I think this is very important for the community to get to know us a little bit better and we to know you better and share our stories. And for us as Latino people to be a contribution to society and set an example of always doing what is right and always trying to keep moving ahead and trying to um, get other people motivated uh, to continue this tradition of dancing and, and keep moving forward. Um, I want to thank you very much. And um, I would like to present somebody who already been introduced a few times. But this is Mr. Manuel Rubio. And uh, he is going to talk to you more about his story. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. I've got a timer here. For one, I want to thank Michelle, first Eliasel, and Renee for throwing my name out as somebody who could join the group. I want to thank Michelle for putting this together, together with the uh, Cal Center, and also Giselle, the host, the one who came up with the thought of how to present Minnesota dance in the Latin community, or Latin dance, in a, in a different way, not by having us dance for you, but having us tell you about our own personal stories. Um, I think... Um, I'm, for one, a retiree of the U.S. Postal Service almost six years ago, um, and I've been teaching dance for just over 30 years. Now, how did I get started? It's, it's been a journey, an evolution. That's how I thought of it. Um, and it started with various influences. First of all, I was born in Puerto Rico, Rio Piedra, and I came to the States when I was a year and 10 months old. The first person that I would say influenced me in music was my mom. And whether that makes me a mama's boy, I don't know, but <laughs> I'll relate something else later uh, that might cue you to that. Uh, but my mom would always play the radio. And she would always have this music going, and it wasn't always what I really could gravitate to or caught my ear. It was uh, music from the hills of Puerto Rico. And then there was all the advertisements, so it was difficult to get into it. But on certain occasions, she was in a very good mood, and she said, come on, let's dance. So I would dance with my mom. And that was really when I started to dance, but not a lot, but enough to make me say, huh, this is fun. I like this. But time goes by, and... You know, you start to play in the neighborhood, you start to get involved with sports. And so at 14 years of age, I could say I fell in love with basketball. I was playing so baseball already and softball, stickball, but basketball just became something I was very fascinated with. And I think it had to do with, it was a way of expressing myself in movement. Well, that same year, I fell in love again with dancing. I went to an uncle's house, met some cousins on my mom's side, and 
they were playing the music of the Joe Cuba Sextet. Never heard the music before, but man, did I love it. Didn't know how I could dance, but man, I had fun dancing with my cousins. So that was a wonderful experience. Now my appetite started to build to learn more Latin music. So I would listen to the symphony set show on Monday nights without, I think, my parents knowing it from 11 to 12. Because <laughs> I was kind of late, I had to get up early, and I gave them a hard time getting up. Well, that was Latin jazz. Then I started to hear music of the Fania All-Stars. And a lot of the many other artists and bands that you had in New York at the time. But I still wasn't so into dance. Um, I think I would describe myself as a shy kid. And given the option to meet a young lady like Giselle or Rebecca or some pretty girl, I would choose, let's go play basketball. That's comfortable. Well, what I found through the years was that I would have wonderful times at weddings. Even though I was afraid to approach women, at weddings, women would come to me. So it was a different experience. Well, through the years, you know, I became known as the guy that always danced. And I had some guy spreading a rumor in New York saying, Puerto Rican Fred Astaire. That was interesting. I found that out years later. But it's because I was always dancing. So, at about that time, I must have been about 28, I met my wife, Katie Dorr, and she was a wonderful woman who was studying and eventually got her master's and was inspiring to me because she gave me the motivation to pursue things that I loved. She gave me three lovely young daughters. Two of them are here. Would you just stand? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. The other one's in, um, in uh, California. Well, I eventually had met many of the Latin uh, families here, and I met a woman named Mila Yauhel, who's Misa, uh, Isa, Maria Isa's daughter, I mean aunt. And she was into choreographing me music, and she was going to do something at the Heart of the Beast, which my daughters got used to going there for the puppets and the May Day Parade. And so I said, like some of the artists mentioned, Hey, you gonna do that? Hey, you want, I can help you, sure. Yeah, I didn't even think of it. I just jumped right in. Well, I performed three nights a week for a month. Somebody caught, was in there who said, hey, her name was Irene Gomez Bethke. She was the owner of the Institute of Art and Culture. She said, would you like to teach at a park? And I said, yes, yeah, sure. Never taught before, but sure. How about this other park? Okay, okay. Then the Sabathany Community Center, where they had the tapestry folk dance. And I, they brought Latin dance, or Latin inst dance instruction there, so I started to teach there. Oh. Well, I'll just make this quick. I was down to three minutes, then it disappeared. Um, <laughs> well, you meet other people who went to dance, and you make a connection. Met a woman named Yvette Trotman. She was teaching Afro-Caribbean dance at MCTC, Minneapolis Community and Technical College. So, oh, she said, why don't you teach? I said, okay, so I called up and said, okay, we set it up, and I started to teach there. They had me then teach in Edina. Then I wound up connecting with Nokomis, with Burnsville. These are all community ed programs. I connected with the Hopkins Center for the Arts, Hopkins Community Ed, which I taught for about 20 years there. Well, you know, um, I, uh, things were going good. I was being asked to teach at weddings, to teach at private events, at venues, you know. Um, and then uh, about uh, in 1998, uh, uh, my wife came. She, she was stricken with can cancer. She struggled for three years. I eventually lost her, and, but still I had three daughters. I had to keep living. I had to keep pushing ahead. So I had to keep teaching. I was teaching four nights a week. Um, life had to go on, and I did. 
uh, in time, I was able to um, meet uh, another young lady who helped me teach. She was just glad to be dancing, so she says, I'll help. And that woman became a friend and eventually became a girlfriend. And that was eight minutes. I'll make this wrap this up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that woman um, eventually um, became my wife 11 years ago and has been a very supportive woman to me and what I'm doing to my daughters. So I, I've been blessed with two wonderful women in my life. Um, and while I was teaching at, El, uh, at First Avenue, I did get to meet Renee and um, Eliasel. And what Eliasel didn't say, he said he won the contest, but then he competed a few more times and won those contests too. So he, he was like, I was thinking of, listen, you know, we can't have you keep doing this. You're the only one. You're going to win everything, <laughs> you know. But he moved on, and Renee was able to have a very profound impact in the community of dance. Um, my life, not only was it a journey, it was an evolution. It evolved. Um, I wound up meeting uh, some young ladies, Amy Miller and Shelly Kiana uh, from the Ordway. And they had me a couple of times teach after a performance. They also then, in 2010, for six years, they had the summer dance series. And I was chosen to teach the salsa. A wonderful experience, getting up on stage with hundreds of people and just teaching them. So for me, um, I've looked at dance as a blessing, something that was a gift from above. I adopted a phrase called I live to dance, I dance to live, and I live to dance. Uh, because it was so important to me. Um, I never went to school to learn how to dance. I just kept growing as I kept taking on new responsibilities of music and dance. Uh, and so um, I'm very grateful. I consider myself to have been blessed with an ability to, to share with what I do and what I'm passionate about of music and be able to share it with thousands and thousands of people. And so today, I am honored to have been asked to come here and speak to you and share my life as far as my dance experiences uh, with you. And I thank you for being here. And uh, now what we are going to do is, Michelle's going to ask for a couple of volunteers in the audience who would like to speak for two to three minutes. So what I will do is, oh, she's right here. Um, but thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So part of the, the joy in the series is that it's completely flawed. Somebody's memory might be a little bit off, the dates might be a little wrong, but it's, it's the, the message and the stories that are really important. Okay, and so um, we create this map, which is also, you know, an artistic interpretation. So we want to ask you to fill in your story. So, yeah, why you started dancing in Minnesota, some things you remember about dancing here in Minnesota. We're trying to just make this map that as complete as we can make it with who's here today so that we can share that. So I'll keep passing the mic around. Just put your hand up. Just say your name. Hello, my name is Rebecca Ramirez. Um, I started dance actually at a very late age. I um, had more of a background in gymnastics when I was a young girl and had a father who was a carpenter and mom an aspiring artist. Uh, I always wanted to go to art school and uh, they didn't have a gymnastics and art school in one so I ended up in um, close to uptown MCAT. I don't know if any of you guys have heard of it. I was lucky enough to get there by scholarship because it was pricey for my family to afford. And uh, I I gave gymnastics a back seat, and I remember some of my best friends from school who happened to be from Iran, um, three Persian girls, and they said, you know, I want to go salsa dancing. I said, that sounds amazing. That sounds so cool. I've never gone salsa dancing. However, in gymnastics, every single floor exercise routine I had had 
some type of Latino influence, the Gypsy Kings were like the most amazing thing I had ever heard. Because in, in where I was from, uh, Bayport, Minnesota, very small little town, it was hard to find these influences. It was very much like, if you had Bob Marley, that was pretty global. <laughs> and uh, there really wasn't much that I had, but I went to Sam Goody and I bought a CD and I happened to pick a winner and I was like, I love this music. So I had um, the Florex routine Bambaleo and I had a Florex of some interpretive dance that I thought was Latin and everything like in my mind was from Mexico because typical Minnesota girl, <laughs> Ellie. <laughs> and um, anyhow, my girlfriends moving forward asked me to go out dancing and they said, oh, you like this music? I was playing in the background at the service bureau in my college and I said, I love it, let's go dancing. So I got my first taste of salsa dancing at Famous Dave's in Uptown. And that was my catalyst to the beginning of dancing where I met Ellie and a group of really amazing people. So long story short, I jumped on that horse and that's what I've been doing since, so. I'm not a professional dancer, but um, I do love to dance, and I, I just want to tell a story about a friend of ours from college who married um, a young woman from Venezuela, Mariela, and they invited us to Thanksgiving dinner one year, and she had her family there, and there were about, I'd say, between 20 and 30 people, and after dinner, they pushed all the furniture away and cleared the floor, put on the music, and everybody started dancing. and. Um, that was just the best Thanksgiving I ever had. <laughs> and I tell that story because for me, the Latino dance community is about community, and it's about dancing for everybody, and it's something that we all enjoy. It's just a part of who we are as humans, and uh, I just appreciate it so much, and thank you so much for what you bring to us. Thank you. Thank you. Alice Gabura. <laughs> Hey, I'm Dario Mejia. Um, I'd like to just start out by saying we don't necessarily choose to dance, but dance chooses us. Uh, just to be able to share a space with other people. Um, I am Giselle's uh, older brother, so I've grown up in a very similar environment to her all my life, uh, with my father and my mother falling in love salsa dancing all the way through um, to us building a, a company and really being able to share that through a school and um, uh, the, the, the most enjoyable part is really keeping the fun in learning. Um, a lot of our students, sure they may be of Scandinavian descent or of all different sorts uh, here in Minnesota, a lot of Ukrainian or all, many different mixtures, but it's really fun to be able to see them move their hips or, or, or shake and have that joy come out of them that I've seen for years happen um, from my father's Latin American culture where family is sharing. Um, I don't get to see that as much on my mother's side, but it is still a really great blessing to know that I can get up on stage and dance for them and they'll still come and see the performances and they'll still take joy in it, uh, that's for sure. Um, but thank you for having this occasion. I'm guessing someone else wants to say something? Oh, oh my gosh, yeah. Uh, I'll have to say, uh, so when I met their dad, one dance on the dance floor, done deal. <laughs> and Giselle talked about you know somebody, it's just so spiritual, it's so deep. You dance with somebody and you make these connections that are so profound. And we're still really good friends. I still love to dance with them. <laughs> we had the marimba at our wedding. And it was rural Esmeraldas, it was out on the hacienda. And it was, and Giselle now has a master's thesis about the marimba, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. 
My name is Tammy Shaw Sykes. You'll never find me on the stage, <laughs> but you will find me dancing in the streets. Life seems to be full circle. I remember checking out music, exposing myself to something different. The only CD I never ever returned was Glory Estefan. I did pay the bill, <laughs> but I found that I really loved Latin music and it hadn't been exposed to me. Fast forward a few years, I was on a trip to where my daughters had really enjoyed their classroom trips. We went to Costa Rica. I understand your jungles and the rainforest and sometimes you kind of wonder how you're going as the rain roads literally wash away in just hours. It, the howling monkeys, it's an amazing place. We had the opportunity to be with a middle income family and traveled with them and through the doctors we were, and his friends, we were able to stay at a resort. And at that resort they had salsa by the poolside and I started to dance to that. Then the door, would st each day, there was a knock on the door. Can you come out and dance with us? And I went, really? By the way, I'm an older dancer too. I was over 40. So I came back and I decided, I hate exercise. But this music, it really moves me. So I came back and I found, the internet was just starting back then, and I searched for salsa. And that's how I found Renee Dennis Thompson at the Tapestry, which I've also heard of. And so danced with him as long as, until he left there and then with Mom Chell. And as life would transpire back, I was doing the same, escaping out of life. Sometimes I'd literally dance for an hour and a half with you, sometimes three hours, only to go right back to work after a 12, 14 hour day. I'd have a little break and head back. It was a great escape, as my marriage was ending as well. Life turned differently. I found myself single, and people go, why, if you know how to dance, and I said, well, I stepped away from partner dancing, but if I do not learn how to be a good follow, I'll never find a good relationship if I always have to take over the lead. So I learned how to partnership dancing. That was very important. By the way, the hyphen in my name means I remarried my husband didn't dance, but he teaches now. We teach East Coast Swing. He didn't, didn't ever expect to, and I said, you know, I don't need to find an answer. But he decided that that was something that we both enjoy. And we teach other people that they don't want to dance for competition. They just want to meet new people, escape from life for a little while, dance in the streets, it's not a, and learn how to incorporate that socialness as I organize a social group as well. 50 some people came just for potluck last night. So it's been great to see how Renee dances in the street at Open Streets last year. And I went from massage therapy to, oh, but I like to move. So yes, I'm also a personal trainer and I own a studio. And I was so glad a couple of years ago when Renee had some time and teaches at my studio. And you've you have no idea how quiet it gets during the day and how much I look forward to dancing with you in the evenings. Thank you. I didn't ask for this. <laughs> My name is Carmen, Carmen Rubio, his other half. And I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. I came to the United States when I was 18. And for a lot of years, I really didn't do any Latin dance, but I grew up dancing because that's part of my culture. So for the longest time, I didn't dance, but it, dancing is like riding a bike. Once you learn it, it just stays with you. So for a lot of years, I didn't dance, but I happened to lose my husband. Um, after 31 years together, and um, then my friend kind of enticed me into going out dancing, and I just, you know, that was my a way of escaping, and I just, when I go out to dance, when I dance, I don't think of anything, it's just like, I, it's, it's just dancing, and I just love it, and then I met this man here, that's my best partner here, he's the best dancer I ever know, <laughs> so, um, it's just been a great experience, and dancing is my life. Yes, it's in my blood. So thank you very much.
okay, I'm totally new to this whole scene, like two, three months ago, and I just have one question. Can an old white broad learn to move? I'm a lot older than you. <laughs> so, Renee. I think, the, I think the answer is yes. Uh, that's what I got from this panel, is that he, it's never too late to start dancing. In my experience, you know, if, if you hear all the stories, yeah. no one of us went to school to learn how to dance. We, all of us, came from the real poor situation and we found in the, in the, in, in the dance, you know, like a need, a necessity to express ourselves. And then the, the dance trap, a trap tops, and we couldn't get, we couldn't let it go. And then you learn through, through the years. It never is, never, you never are too old to learn. It, it's not about time or age. It's about desire, a willingness to do it, and, and, and passion and love, and dedicate at least five minutes a day to check your body. Oh, you're gonna feel great. Uh, in Brazil, we have this thing now that we, it's called the best age, and I'm not sure how old you are, but that you need to be 65 or older, and then there are clubs like for you to go every single night of the week, and then you know a lot of people started dancing. Then some people became a widow, and then they never got to do a chance to dance before. That's when they started dancing, yeah. and it's, it's huge. It's like every single day of the night is a chance to dance. Yeah, it's not about age. So I have a question because when we were doing our planning for this talk, everybody kept talking about first half, first half, first half. And for me, that's, you know, I think about Prince, I think about rock and roll and punk rock, and I never think Latin dance. So who would like to tell me about what was happening at first half? Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Hi. I'm Carla. Um, I know many of you, you look very familiar. Um, so I just jumped up because I, I love First Ave. That's where I think I, my dancing skills just skyrocketed because anybody was welcome at First Ave. Like every Thursday it was Latin music and there was a DJ in the main floor and the, the second floor was like reggae and different stuff. Anyway, everybody was welcome however they were, old, young, tall, short. And so you just go there to dance and everybody wants to dance with you you know, and people will line up and just, it was just so much fun. And so that's, that's where I really grew as far as my skills because I started with cumbia, that's all I knew. And then I would go to First Ave and I learned everything else. And I just, it's like a big buffet of just whatever you want because they played everything. So it was kind of like a religion for me in college. I would go every Thursday and like many people said, it was just an escape. It was just fun, you just let go, you just, you know, just, you can be, you don't have to be anybody. You don't have to be a student. You don't have to be. And you just had a great time. And everyone was really friendly. So I can't remember how many years ago they stopped doing it, but it was really sad because it was just such a staple as far as Latin music. So did anybody else get a chance to go out there in the room? No? Yeah? Okay. Yeah, you, you mentioned that. And maybe we danced. Who knows? That was, that was a long time ago. Um, but real quick, my story as far as dancing. Um, I started off as a rockette. Um, not the New York Rockettes. It's, I was from Rochester, Minnesota, and I was in a dance line in high school. So, like, the kicks. And I had no dance training. I just jumped into it, and I didn't know what I was doing. And I just, every year that would go by, I just learned more and more and more, and I watched everybody else. Part of it is just watching, because a lot of girls had jazz, tap, ballet, and they were amazing. And I was just like, okay, I know what I have to aspire to. And then I moved to Twin Cities when I was 18, and I had no Latin dance background at all. My dad's from Mexico, my mom's from Minnesota, and they met in Mexico, but by the time I was two, they were divorced and I was here. So I had no, nothing, no music, and so I came and I was at the Quest, and I was 18 years old, and they had Latin night on Mondays. That was another great one, and I stepped out, someone asked me to dance. I had no idea what I was doing, and I, we made, made it through the song, and I fell in love with Latin music and everybody was there happy and just smiling and having a good time. And I was like, I gotta get more of this. So, thanks. Anybody, anybody, anybody? Well, uh, you know, the, in ballroom dancing, most of our students start when they are older because that's when you pretty much can't afford it. <laughs> Uh, 
young people go to First Avenue or social clubs to learn because you just pay the cover charge. But, uh, you know, some of the people that I teach, uh, Janet, Kathy, Sally, uh, they didn't start when they were young. And they, they look young to me. And when I teach them, I don't teach them like they are older. I, I teach everybody the same, same way. We don't uh, think differently because you are 80 or 17. We teach everybody the same, same way. And, um, and it's very interesting because the, the mass of memory and how the brain works for everybody is pretty much the same. You really don't see that much difference. Everybody kind of had the same difficulty. Gravity doesn't forgive anyone. <laughs> and uh, it's kind of the same principle all across. And I think the biggest thing when we teach, what I have found, is not the dance steps that is hard to teach. It's sometimes how your mind is thinking. If your mind is open to learn and, and hungry to learn, and, and you know, dancing give you this thing kind of we say that it's not what you get in the end, it's what you become getting there. Because through all this uh, career of dancing and owning a dance studio, you had to become something else. If you are the same, you will not survive. So you had to grow and research and become creative and become uh, smarter in how you think and how you approach people and find the ways of teach things better. Um, but uh, no, I mean, being older is almost a privilege to learn to dance because when you're younger, if you dance a lot, your body gets worn out. And as you get older, you cannot do as much. But when you're older, you start, you're still in good shape, right? Maybe we can ask Janet. What do you think, Janet? Okay, yeah. I was, I was over 50 before I started to dance. I never did anything as a young person I thought I was uncoordinated and just too shy and just not gonna happen but in 2000 um, I was divorced and I thought you know I'm just not gonna spend the rest of my life watching people dance I'm going to start <laughs> and once I started I the, the very first lesson I just realized I was smiling the whole time and that that just gave me an indication of how much I needed to do that for myself. It wasn't for, you know, it was eight years of group lessons before I started with Ellie, but it uh, it's just gets better and better. I just love it. This is what dance and music brings to you, joy, power, you know, fun, and it doesn't matter how old or how young you are. If you feel it inside you, let it out and enjoy, you know, as, as, as long as you are here, alive, breathing, enjoy. If you can breathe and dance after you're dead, do it too. Music is good. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Daniel Williams. I'm a St. Paulite, born and raised and partner with Carla here, who, you know, we used to go, I used to go to First Ave and I never saw her, so I still don't know what I did wrong. But we did meet <laughs> at Loring Pasta Bar again uh, about a year and a half ago, so that's great. Um, I think I want to say more of like a thank you to, you know, I, I heard Renee say like, you know, thank you America for for accepting you, but like this country is better because of you and because of this music, you know, and I'm, I'm, you know, yeah, let's, I have to say thank you. I have to say thank you, you know, because it's, uh, I could go on and on, but I want to keep it positive, you know. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not Latino, but I play one on TV, right? So I'm good friends with uh, Leo Lada, who many of you know, the Ecuadorian musician, and I used to get mistaken for Leo's son, Pacho, all the time. So people would come up to me and speak Spanish to me, and I was just, I don't know really what you're saying, but, and uh, I think I saw Leo Paixão dance for the first time at Leo Lada's house, uh, you know, dance, dancing samba years ago. And, you know, I've seen, I've seen Manny, Manny, I've seen your face over the years at Salsa, and, you know, that's a big part of the community, is like, you see familiar faces. You might not know who's around, you might not know exactly who people are, but you see people. 
And, uh, you know, I always, I was drawn to this music uh, as somebody who's African American and, and white, a uh, Minnesotan going back four generations, but uh, always felt that uh, this brought something special to this place, you know, and I think that's just, we have to thank everybody who comes from any other country, and especially those who bring music and arts, uh, because it just enriches, it, it changes the way we live. You know, I, I don't know if, who it was that said it was a life style or it was family. Who was, somebody's talking about family. I think it was you. But, you know, it really, like, to be together is to be, it's about a way of being together. It's not just about dancing, you know. So, so I'm just thankful to you guys to, for being here. Yeah. As a massage therapist, I went on for, to study functional movement, and you were mentioning older people, and you guys bring so much more than just joy. Do you realize when you're partnership dancing, you're teaching so that people have 25% reduction of Alzheimer's. Learning new things is important at all ages. That agility of moving side to side, the strengthening of the hip joints, moving all different directions, that strengthening, that balance, that flexibility, you teach more than just the joy of the heart. You're still strengthening, keeping people young, inside and out, all the way from the cells to the bones to the mind. Thank you. Just as a quick follow-up to what the young man mentioned, when I first came out here before 2000, um, once every two months, there was a Latin band that played. And so it was a big event. You went out. And now you can go out every night of the week to multiple places, multiple venues, and lots of people to teach you. So salsa or Latin music has had a big, profound impact in Minnesota. And it'll continue to grow as more people, I've said in the past, become more addicted or addicted to the music, they'll be inspired and they'll take it to different levels. So I'm glad I was a big part of it and started years back, but thank you. Um, I also, I just wanted to mention um, Leo and Kati Lara were our musical teacher at La Semana, the adopted youth culture camp. And it just, what brings me back time and time again are the people and um, it's this web. It's just this spider web. And I met Gail here, which I would like you to talk for just this moment, at uh, Leo's class. And she comes up to me and she says, it, it was actually like, I think after a couple classes, and she said, is your last name Mejia? And I, sa I said, yeah. And she said, like, was your father Luis Enrique Mejia, the only Ecuadorian with the green eyes? <laughs> Which is, and we make this connection. She used to, with her husband, would um, protest. They were protesting the Nicaraguan War with my parents growing up. And then we meet later on in life. And um, it continuously happens at those social dance events. Uh, you just continue to meet the community because it's, it's a gathering, it's a celebration, it's a moment for you to, to reach out to other people throughout the cold season. And Gail, you wanted to say something? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, um, I can join in with the people that were talking about starting dance late because I uh, started taking Leo's Zumba class in my late 50s and now I'm 64 and taking all kinds of dance. I studied with Leo and um, also branched into African dance too. So I, I kind of can't get enough of it, but it is, it is a way of being with people. I really, I really like, I think it was you that said that. You know, you don't have to w worry about like what people believe. Uh, if you agree, you're just moving together. You know, like like breath, breathing together, moving together. And anyway, I I, I agree. Joy is not so easy to come by, though. So, I mean, any way we can get it, um, I think, just as important as hip joints. <laughs> Are 
You've got a great story to tell. age seems to be such a thing um, right now. I started when I was 60. I met El Yasser at 60. And I've been dancing with him so many years. <laughs> and um, I, actually, I had finished a, a doctorate in, in psychology, and I had been a single mom. And so life was really tough. And after about four years after my doctorate, I thought, I'm going to dance. I'd always wanted to because I felt like a klutz. So I walked into the studio, and I met this guy who didn't speak a word of English. <laughs> and they gave me him as a teacher. And I said, what the heck is this guy going to teach me anyway? Well, my gosh, I'm still here. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I love it. And um, you know, it, it's very therapeutic, as you had said. And um, I find it's good for everybody. Um, I, that's all I'm going to say. She stays around to try to uh, finally understand what I'm saying. She has to wait oh, six right. years. I <laughs> am. <laughs> okay, guys, um, before we finish today, I think it was beautiful. And I'm, I'm honored to be here, but it's beautiful for all of you sharing uh, your experience and your story with us the same way that we did with you. I just have a simple request for all of you. And believe me, what I'm gonna ask you for, help me through all my, my life to go through difficult times and good times, feeling great and blessed. Please share your story of your experience about dance and music with your neighbor, with somebody else. Don't keep it for yourself. You know, there is so many people who has a recent, a different view or misconception or misinterpretation of what Latin dance is about or what Latin music is about or Latin culture. You know, we are really good friends of Mexicans. We know we, all of us are Mexicans. You know, we come from different backgrounds. And then we bring, we bring different experience and different things. And, but the main goal and the root of all of this is the power of joy. Guys, trust me, I, I work in hospitals and cancer people, you know, and I see the power healing of music and dance and that talk, talk, because that is, that the best advertising that you can ever do for the way you're feeling, not for us, we can go and find students, you know, is for, you know, to share what you're feeling and how the music changed you or changed your life or help you to go through different difficult times, like in the case of Manis, we spend over here how the music and the dance start like a mask for all that sorrow and all that nostalgic and, and things and becoming part of a life, you know, and then we smile and we dance and we share everything. Please share all your experience with whoever comes to your life, talk to them. And tell if people, no, I don't dance, I got two left feet. It doesn't matter, I got three left feet and I'm dancing. <laughs> you know, encourage people, they're gonna be grateful later, they're gonna come back to you and say, you know what, that day that you told me to go to dance, girl, you was right. I changed my life. Thank you. So just a few things before we wrap up. One, if you shared your story, please go see Kristen to make sure that she spelt your name correctly because we'd like to have that well documented. Um, this is the last of this series here at the Cole Center. Next season, we're going to be at the Ordway. So I want to thank uh, the Cole Center for hosting us for three years and starring, starting this inventory and archive of all these great stories. Um, I had a wonderful group of advisors, so I just want to thank them. Linda Shapiro, Nancy Masonhauser, Judith Bryn Ingber, <clears throat> Cecily Marcus, and Kate Ouija. And of course, the great Kristen Van Loon, who's done almost all, all but one of the, um, the maps. So we've got this, these great documents of these talks. Now, before we move to the Ordway, we're going to have 
an open house at the archives. So we've been collecting all this stuff and we're gonna bring it to the archives. So in August, August 27th, we're gonna all meet up at the archives, we're gonna deliver the last of the materials, but we're gonna talk about what it means to collect stories and put this together for research in the future. So August 27th from two to four, it's free, it's at the archives in the um, Anderson Library I'm looking for cues, and um, it's called Dance Influences and Archives. It's an open house and an invitation to contribute. So thank you so much for being here today, and I look forward to seeing you next year. That's right.